Section 4 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Barons and Knights in the Great Charter by J. H. Round, LLD. The passage in the Great Charter on which I propose to comment is contained in its second chapter and is here italicized. Si quis comitum vel baronum nostrorum, siwe aliorum tenencium de nobis in capite per servicium militare mortuus fuerit, et cum decesserit here sues plene etatis fuerit, et relevium debeat habeat hereditatem suam per antiquum relevium. Scilicet heres vel heredes comitis de baronia comitis integra per centum libras. Heres vel heredes baronis de baronia integra per centum libras. Italics. Heres vel heredes militis de feodo militis integro per centum solidos ad plus. End italics. Et qui minus deburit minus det secundum antiquam consuetudinem feodorum. If we view these provisions in isolation and endeavour to make the text here its own interpreter, we observe one that those to whom they apply are the tenants in chief by night service. Two that these are divided into three categories. A. Earls, Barons, and others. B. Earl, Baron, and Knight. 3. That the holdings recognised are only two, viz. the barony and the knight's fee. It is important to observe that in this chapter no distinction is made between greater and lesser barons. The difficulty presented by these provisions is that no one has been able to give a satisfactory explanation of the difference between the baron and the knight, or between the two holdings here specified, when their holders were alike tenants-in-chief by knight's service. The baron's returns of their knights, Cartae Baronum, in 1166, imply that all such tenants-in-chief stood on the same footing, and that the milites were not among them, but were the under-tenants whom they had enfeoffed upon their lands. The above difficulty was already felt in the 17th century, when Selden considered that the holdings of tenants-in-chief were originally alike in status, but were subsequently differentiated, some being classed as baronies and others as knights' fees. Maddox, on the other hand, boldly assumed that the difference in status of the two holdings went back to the Norman conquest, that, quote, William I enfeoffed his barons of their baronies, or his knights of their knights' fees. End quote. While I do not presume to hope that I shall wholly solve a difficulty by which historians and antiquaries have been so long baffled, I shall endeavour to elucidate the problem to the best of my ability, and to clear away some of the confusion by which it is at present surrounded, for it affects an important development in our constitutional history. That problem is the status and fate of those lesser tenants-in-chief who ceased to attend the Great Council. Were these lesser barons known as barones minores, or as milites. And, if the latter, is it possible to trace any connection between these milites and the representative knights of the shire? There has been, if I may venture to say so, on the part of the commentators on the charter, too much glossing and too much assumption. When we examine the text itself, we find, one, that in the second chapter dealing with reliefs, the two classes below the earls are the baron and the knight. Two, that in the fourteenth chapter dealing with summons to the council, the two classes below the earls are the maiores barones and all those others who hold of us in chief. 
it has been assumed but not proved that in both chapters and for both purposes the line of division is the same and it follows as a consequence of this assumption that quote, the barones of one clause of the great charter seem to be the barones maiores of another it seems that the baro who has a baronia in the one clause is the baro mayor who is to have a special summons in the other clause end quote. maitland the constitutional history of england nor is this the only consequence which follows from that assumption for it involves we find the still more improbable equation of the knight miles who held a knight's fee in chapter two with the alleged barones minores of chapter fourteen i use the term alleged because in spite of the freedom with which the phrase is used by the commentators on the charter it is not found in that chapter or indeed anywhere else in the text of the document this is no mere verbal quibble the phrase barones maiores does indeed imply that there were lesser barons but it certainly does not involve the gloss that quote, all those others who hold of us in chief end quote, were barones minores they might and judging from chapter two they would comprise at least the knights as well as the lesser barons in which case these classes were distinct and the alleged equation disappears let me endeavour to make the point absolutely clear the tenants in chief by knight service include according to chapter two a barons b knights chapter fourteen introduces a further distinction by speaking of maiores barones this no doubt implies the existence of barones minores but it does not affect the knights who would remain as before distinct from all barons whether greater or less therefore miles cannot be used as the equation of baro minor putting the point differently the line in chapter two which is concerned with reliefs is so drawn as to include the minor barons with greater ones but in chapter fourteen which is concerned with separate summons it is drawn athwart the baronage and by excluding the lesser barons creates so far as summons is concerned a fresh class again the phrase all others who hold of us in chief in chapter fourteen may include in addition to the lesser barons not merely the knights but others such as tenants by sergeanty stubbs indeed admits in one place when speaking of the greater and lesser barons that quote, the entire body of tenants in chief included besides these i e the greater barons the minor barons the knightly body and the sockage tenants of the crown end quote, all of whom he deems were entitled to be summoned by the general summons as provided in chapter fourteen it is true that he writes in another place of the phrase barones secundi dignitatis who are admitted to be identical with the barones minores that quote, hallam rightly understands this to refer to the knightly tenants in chief end quote, which virtually accepts the wrong equation but this only illustrates the need of greater clearness in definition no one i think will suspect me of imperfect appreciation where our great historian is concerned but his work occasionally betrays a certain vagueness of conception a lack of clearness in definition which perhaps is sometimes met with in the work of english scholars for instance we first find him treating of the great council in norman times and recognizing the barons greater and less and the knights as distinct classes among its members but when he turns to the composition of this same great council under henry and his sons he appears to lose sight of the essential distinction between these classes this i think was due to the influence upon him of gneist to whom we may clearly trace the fundamental error of confusing the line drawn by the charter chapter two between the baron and the knight 
with that which it draws chapter fourteen between the greater baron and the tenants in chief below them Geneist, quote, from the first the distinction between barones maiores and minores was known in the exchequer reliefs wardships and marriages of the great feudatories formed the principal items in the financial administration whilst those of the single knight's fee were fixed at a hundred shillings those of the greater lordships were not until later times fixed at a hundred marks stubbs quote, Gneist points out that in the exchequer the difference of relief between a hundred shillings for the knight and a hundred marks for the baron in the court and in the shire moot the interval between the two classes must have made itself apparent dialogus de scaccario two ten end quote. by the interval between the two classes stubbs here obviously means the distinction of maiores and minores barones yet dialogus de scaccario two ten so far from making that distinction actually denies that there was any so far as relief was concerned here again the identity of the knight with the minor baron is wrongly assumed in the history of english law pollock and maitland it will be found have fallen victims to the same confusion they write vaguely of the greater men and the lesser men and evidently treat as identical the two lines of division which we have to keep distinct another error traceable to geneist is the connection of the distinction between greater and lesser barons with two passages in doomsday Gneist, quote, at the time of doomsday book the maxim held good that only vassals tiny who possess six maneria or less should pay relevium to the wike comes those possessing more than six maneria pay immediately into the exchequer at all events this principle is expressly mentioned in two counties doomsday two eighty b two ninety eight b end quote. Stubbs, quote, it may indeed be fairly conjectured that the landowners in doomsday who paid their relief to the sheriff those who held six manors or less and those who paid their relief to the king stood in the same relation to one another end quote, as the greater and lesser barons professor adams similarly refers to the antiquity of the distinction drawn in chapter fourteen of the charter quote, see the difference in the payment of relief in doomsday one two eighty vinogradoff society in the eleventh century page three o eight note two end quote. now the two passages in doomsday to which gneist refers relate only to yorkshire and to derbyshire and knots and i have explained in feudal england pages seventy two to three that the practice described is part of that duodecimal system which is peculiar to the danish district in the northern portion of england it would not consequently be met with outside that district that is to say in the larger portion of the country it could therefore have nothing to do with the later distinction between greater and lesser barons this point is of some importance if improbable though it may seem we have here the origin of stubb's statement that the lesser tenants in chief paid their reliefs to the sheriff but the greater ones direct to the crown this statement is repeated without question by maitland by pollock and maitland and by professor medley it is however at variance with the evidence of the pipe rolls which proves that holders of a single fee or even less are found paying their reliefs as directly to the crown as a great baron hitherto i have been endeavouring to prove that the line drawn in the second chapter between barons and knights by the charter has nothing to do with that which it draws in its fourteenth chapter between the greater barons and the rest of the tenants in chief a different and far more difficult question is that of the identity of the knights mentioned in the second chapter 
for the wording of that chapter as i contend is sufficient to prove that they cannot possibly have been as is so loosely assumed the minor barons how then did they differ in status from the barons from whom the amount of their relief distinguishes them so sharply it is usually endeavoured to interpret this chapter of the charter by the help of a glanville's book b the dialogus de scaccario both of them written in the latter part of the reign of henry the second now what glanville says is this quote, cum autem heres masculus et notus heres etatem habens relinquatur in sua hereditate se tenebit ut supradictum est etiam invito domino dum tamen domino suo sicut tenetur suum offerat homagium coram probis hominibus et suum rationabile relevium alicuius juxta consuetudinem regni de feodo unius militis centum solidos de socagio vero quantum valet census ilius socagi per unum annum de baroniis vero nihil certum statutum est quia juxta voluntatem et misericordiam domini regis solent baroniae capitales de relevis suis domino regi satisfacere idem est de seianteriis nine chapter four End quote. the obvious difficulty of this passage is that glanville is here speaking of reliefs due to a lord dominus and yet includes among them the reliefs due from baronies to the king mr mckechnie claims that quote, glanville's words are ambiguous end quote, and there seems to be among the latest commentators some difference of opinion as to whether they cover the case of a knight's fee held in chief ut de corona the authors of the history of english law are alleged to hold that they do though this is by no means clear on the other hand the learned editors of the dialogus de scaccario consider that the holder of such a fee did not enjoy the privilege of a fixed relief and in this they are followed by mr mckechnie and by professor adams who considers him to be right the view of these writers is based on the dialogus which undoubtedly limits the privilege to those knights fees which were held ut de honore si vero de cesserit quis tenens tunc de rege feodum militis non quidem ratione corone regie set potius ratione baronie cuius libet que quoiis casu in manum regis de lapsa est sicut est episcopatus vacante sede heres iam defuncti si adultus est pro feodo militis centum solidos numerabit pro duobus decem libras et ita de inceps juxta numerum militum quos domino deburat antequam ad fiscum de voluta foret hereditas two ten e si vero de escaita fuerit quae in manu regis deficiente herede well aliter inciderit pro feodo militis unius hoc tantum regi nomine relevii soluet quod eset suo domino soluturus hoc est centum solidos two twenty four these statements are exceedingly precise and the editors are justified in inferring from them quote, that the tenant of a single knight's fee would be a baro minor since the certainty of relief depends not on the extent of the estate held but on its being held of a mean lord end quote on the other hand this is at direct variance with the second chapter of the great charter which draws its line of division between barons and knights unless we restrict the latter to those who held ut de honore this we shall see appears to be opposed to another chapter of the charter as well as to the obvious meaning of chapter two itself unfortunately mr mckechnie seeking to produce record evidence that only the quote, tenants of mean lords had their reliefs fixed 
end quote, states by a singular error that quote, Maddox one three fifteen to sixteen cites from pipe rolls large sums exacted by the crown. In one case, three hundred pounds was paid for six fees or ten times what a mean lord could have exacted. Pipe roll twenty fourth regnal year Henry the second. The reference is obviously to the entry which Maddox cites correctly. Quote, Ted Baldus de Walenes debet triginta libra sic de relevio sex militum. Magnus Rotulus, 24th regnal year of Henry the Second. The amount, therefore, was not three hundred pounds, but thirty pounds, the very amount that quote, a mean lord could have exacted. End quote. The knight's fees to which the Dialogus refers in the above parallel extracts cannot well be those mentioned in the second chapter of the Charter, because their case is specially dealt with in its forty-third chapter. Moreover, if that second chapter is read with care, it will be seen that the knight's fee there spoken of had been held not of a mean lord, but directly of the crown, like a barony otherwise it would be tempting to identify the two as it would dispose of the difficulty raised by the passage in chapter two mr mckechnie however does identify the two but admits that on this hypothesis quote, the need for this reference in chapter forty three to relief is not at first sight obvious end quote. It seems to be clear, at least, that the distinctive privilege of paying only five pounds relief on the knight's fee extended to three classes of fees. One, those specially mentioned in chapter 43, which were held of an escheated honour, such as that of Wallingford, etc. Two, those which were held of a fief temporarily in the hands of the crown, owing to wardship or other cause, three those held of an ecclesiastical fief which was in the hands of the crown during a vacancy for all three classes were affected by the same principle viz that the king stood in the shoes of the former holders of the fief and could therefore only exact from the under tenants the same dues as their former lords exacted speaking of this forty-third chapter Mr. McKechnie admits that, though it only mentions escheats, quote, the same rule applied to subtenants of baronies in wardship, which was analogous to temporary escheat, end quote, or of ecclesiastical fiefs during a vacancy. It is, however, conceivable that, as Mr. McKechnie suggests, John wanted to draw a distinction by which he could treat knight's fees held de escaita as held of him ut de corona and therefore liable like baronies to an arbitrary relief but at least under henry the second the pipe rolls do not show any trace of such a claim and confirm the evidence of the dialogus nor has any evidence i believe yet been produced in support of the suggestion with almost monotonous regularity the pipe rolls record reliefs on fees held de escaita at the rate of five pounds on the fee for instance in eleven seventy two michael de preston pays twenty two pounds ten shillings relief on four and a half knights fees de escaitis regis similarly on a lay fief nigel son of the chamberlain pays fifty seven pounds ten shillings on eleven and a half fees held of the honour of richmond then in the king's hands in eleven seventy five while on an ecclesiastical fief hamo fitzwilliam pays eighteen pounds fifteen shillings on three and three quarter fees and robert bruton two pounds ten shillings on half a fee held in each case of the see of canterbury in eleven seventy one it is needless to multiply instances of the rule but exceptions to the rule are worth noting though they are not easy to find and here it may be observed that the evidence of the pipe rolls is by no means so easy to use as might be imagined extreme care in identifying the fees on which relief is paid is constantly required 
as there is often nothing to show whether they are held of a fief or an escheated honour or directly of the king ut de corona for instance in eleven eighty one two men are charged thirty marks relief for two knights fees which had been robert of tilbury's there is nothing to identify these fees or to explain why the relief was twenty pounds instead of ten pounds but they can hardly fail to be the two fees which a later robert of tilbury held of the honour of rayleigh forfeited by henry of essex in west tilbury and childerditch or Denji, essex again gilbert son of gerbert de arquis who pays fifty marks pro fine terre patri sui in eleven eighty two eludes us though the mention of a fine instead of a relief leads one to look for his father and himself among the holders of baronies gilbert however is found only as holding two knights fees of the honour of tickhill in twelve o three his name is not found in a feudary of the honour later in the reign but we do there find malvesin de grava as the holder of two fees this entry is explained by one on the pipe roll of twelve o nine which shows us malvesin de hercy and william rufus charged fifty marks and two palfreys for the succession of their wives to the holding of this gilbert de arquis their father this holding was in grove grava knots which thus descended to the hercys of grove now this case might possibly be claimed as supporting the view that john was trying to extort baronial reliefs from fees held de escaita but it has been shown that the holder of these fees had been similarly charged fifty marks in eleven eighty two and moreover the pipe rolls under john show him regularly paying scutage not as the holder of a barony but only as a tenant of the honour of tickhill mr mckechnie's actual comment on the escheat portion of the charter chapter forty three is this quote, this chapter reaffirms a distinction recognised by henry the second but ignored by john john ignored this distinction extending to tenants ut de escaita the more stringent rules applicable to tenants ut de corona magna carta reaffirmed the distinction End quote. it appears to me that this conclusion is based on the assumption that because the charter limits the rights of the crown it was john who had attempted to extend these rights my own position is that the pipe rolls show the crown's right to feudal incidents to be already extended under henry the second we have now seen that chapter two of the great charter from which this paper started cannot apply to any of the three categories of knights dealt with by the dialogus that is to say not to those who held of a lay or ecclesiastical fief temporarily in the king's hands because the text forbids it or to those who held of an escheated honour because in addition to straining the text such knights are specially dealt with in chapter forty three which is concerned with escheats footnote possibly the right conclusion here is one which has not yet been suggested namely that the charter nowhere provides for the case of knights fees temporarily in the king's hand owing to a wardship or a vacancy because the rights of their holders had not been encroached upon by the crown escheats however seem to have been recognised as a category apart the reason for this may have been that in early days e g in the case of the forfeited fiefs of the bishop of bayeux and the count of mortain the holdings of large under-tenants had actually been converted by the crown into separate baronies owing the service of five or ten knights and appear as such in eleven sixty six these constituted awkward precedents End footnote. who then are the knights that in chapter two are distinguished so sharply from barons by the relief on their succession the ultimate and indisputable evidence on which the answer depends is found in the pipe rolls themselves 
but that evidence has to be combined with that of the various returns of knight's fees especially the cartae baronum of eleven sixty six it may however be said at once that the pipe rolls do show a very marked distinction between the arbitrary sums charged as relief on baronies and those of five pounds or some multiple thereof charged on the knight's fees normally though not always the former are further distinguished by the word finis which is rightly used as implying a composition the difficulty about the latter is that we have to make sure that the fees are held as strictly as the baronies ut de corona footnote professor adams states that quote, the relief of a single knight's fee as recorded in the pipe rolls seems to be frequently one hundred shillings when held seek directly of the king end quote. origin of the english constitution page two one four end footnote although we are not here concerned with the reliefs on sergeanties it is advisable to note that those on the pipe rolls confirm glanville's statement as to their arbitrary character for instance in eleven sixty three the charge of a hundred marks on ralph fitzwigan pro relevio terre sue was on a sergeanty of some value though the fact is not stated so also was that of seventy five marks fifty pounds charged to robert fitzhugh in eleven eighty six pro fine terre sue this terra was at upton granted by henry the second the tenure of his successors the chanceus family proves that it was held by the service of a sergeant for forty days in war which must not be confused with night service End of section 4